I was not planning on facing my potential demise when I started on my stroll that chilly late December's night. My intention was no more than finding something to quench my very pregnant wife's cravings, along with some desperately needed solitude for myself. I don't mean to sound insensitive by any means. I do love my Christine very much. I think I fell for her within the first few moments of the initial meeting that brought us together. I'd been alone for many years before my friends took it upon themselves to arrange the blind date. I'd never cared for such things, but even an introvert such as I could be consumed with loneliness from time to time. She was truly a delight to be around, and it amazed me to find that we had so much in common. I consider myself to be a fairly unique taste, and it has always been difficult for me to form relationships. My small circle of friends had been in my life for what felt like centuries sometimes, but I never could have predicted they would be the ones to introduce me to my soulmate. We married within mere months of being together. I worried we were rushing things a bit, that perhaps we'd not yet outgrown our honeymoon phase, but I'd never been so happy in my life. Over the years, our love for each other never grew stale or predictable, and when she became pregnant, we were overjoyed at the thought of bringing a new member into the family. Unfortunately, my poor Christine endured some complications over the last few months and has found herself mostly bedridden. I've done my best to be the loving and supportive husband she's needed over this troubling time, but this has left little room for me to be alone with my thoughts a necessity for the introverts of the world. So, when she had a late night craving, I was more than happy to take it upon myself to head out for a spell. She was hesitant to let me leave as it was getting quite late and surely few stores would still be open. I assured her I'd be able to track something down, but she still practically begged me to stay home. There'd been a rash of killings of late in our humble little town, but the victims had primarily been brunette women. Four dark-haired ladies and three men of no distinct pattern, to be precise. Our local sheriff feared a serial killer was at large, but I presumed he just watched entirely too many crime shows. Perhaps I was too quick to dismiss his suspicions, as well as proving a little too eager to escape the house for a bit, but I understood Christine's concerns. I promised her I'd keep my phone handy should she need me, before I kissed her on the forehead and made my way out into the night. It may have been wiser for me to arm myself with something more intimidating than my trusty pocket knife, but I wasn't overly concerned. This wouldn't be the first time I'd brave the brisk night air for a midnight snack for my love, and I'm sure it won't be the last. So, I left out from my stroll, leaving the snow-covered car parked. It would have obviously made my trip faster had I chosen to drive, but I wasn't the biggest fan of driving on slippery roads. Plus, the walk would allow me much more time to enjoy a bit of solitude. Once I was far enough away from the house, I lit a cigarette. My wife wasn't exactly fond of the habit that had been a part of my life since my teen years, but that wouldn't stop me from sneaking a few in when I got the chance. This was another thing that was far more rare of late. There are worse things people do behind their spouse's back, so I wasn't exactly burdened with guilt over it. She does have an uncanny sense of smell, though. I always keep hand sanitizer and a small bottle of cologne in my jacket pocket for such occasions. Normally, on nights like these, she'd be too distracted by whatever goodies I brought her to be concerned with whether or not I'd snuck in a smoke or two. Within 15 minutes, I was pushing through the door of the gas and sip. It was a decent little convenience store, which they'd all decked out in Christmas flair. I toured the snack aisle while the little drummer boy echoed from the speakers above my head. I always look forward to hearing the festive music in the stores this time of year, though many would just have the droning elevator-style tunes for ambient background music. Fortunately, my old buddy Eduardo behind the counter made sure to provide songs from his own playlist. Many gas stations wouldn't provide such things for their guest brief visitations, but I think Ed did it more for himself than anyone else. There were only two other people in the store at this hour, an older gent scratching lottery tickets up front, and another guy in the back, sporting a brown hoodie and a thick winter coat. I couldn't see his face, but he appeared to just be aimlessly window shopping. I couldn't help but wonder if he was just waiting for the place to clear out so he could pull a gun on Ed, but he'd only have himself to blame when my friend would inevitably draw the 12 gauge he kept under the counter. 
I shouldn't presume anyone's ill intent, just because they seem to be trying too hard to be inconspicuous, but the world has become a crazy place. Finding nothing to fit my wife's cravings just right, I just delved into the snack cakes. I dropped my armful of Twinkies, Ding Dongs, and Donuts on the counter, to which Ed gave a chuckle. You want some insulin to go with that? He laughed. Yeah, may not hurt to grab a shot or two. I replied with a smile. So is uh, Chris about ready to pop? Ed asked. You have no idea. I laughed. We'd been frequenting this gas station for some time, so Ed was more than familiar with us. He'd even been by the house on a rare occasion he had a day off, but he stayed extra busy of late since his father retired. The store was family owned, but he hoped to be able to hire on a few more hands after the first of the year. God knows the poor guy needs a break. Do you know that guy? I asked, nodding my head to the man in the brown hoodie who still stalked the rear aisle. Never seen him before, Ed replied, handing me the double bagged sack of goodies. Just be safe, man. I said, no worries, brother. My friend said with a wink knocking the barrel of his sawed-off shotgun against the back of the counter. I just gave him a smile as I took the bulging plastic bag from him. Merry Christmas, Ed, I said with a wave while I headed for the door. Back at you, man, he replied. The cold breeze practically smacked me in the face when I pulled the door open. It had been very hot in the gas station and I'd almost forgotten how chilly it was outside. Though I was sure the snacks I had gathered would suit my own sweet tooth, I hated the idea of disappointing Christine. Even with how miserable her advanced pregnancy had been, she rarely asked for anything. The only other store that may be open at this hour was a good couple of miles away. Perhaps I would take a drive tonight after all. Having decided to return to my house to grab the car, I turned my back to the gas and sip and began my trip. I figured I'd check back in on my wife before heading back out into the cold, though I was sure she'd try to talk me out of it. Still, I'd be damned if I was going to let her down, so my mind was made up. I dug my earbuds out of my jacket pocket and queued up my own Christmas playlist to guide my path home. Perhaps it wasn't the best choice to tune out the world around me. I likely should have been paying more attention to my surroundings as I traversed the snowy sidewalk to my festive melody. It was my own fault that I didn't even see it coming. Whatever it was that struck me across the back of the head immediately knocked me unconscious. I can't be sure how long I was out for, but when my eyes opened back up, I found I was strapped down to a frigid metal table in a darkly lit room. Leather belts were buckled around each wrist and ankle, and my coat and shirt had been removed. It was freezing to the point I could see my shaky breath exiting my mouth while my heart thumped so hard I could see my chest bouncing. After a moment, fluorescent lights flickered on above me, causing my eyes to burn slightly. You know, I wasn't sure if anyone else would be out this late, a voice said from behind where I lay. I was about to settle for the old guy before you walked in, he continued as he strolled around the metal table. He pulled down the brown hood to reveal a thin face with a dark beard stubble. I'd say he was maybe early 30s at most, thick shaggy hair, long pointy nose, pale skin, and immaculate white teeth from what I could tell. He appeared taller now than he had at the convenience store, but that could just be the effect of me being strapped down to a slab close to his waistline. I didn't want to grab the guy behind the counter. He'd likely be missed, plus the security cameras would surely catch me dragging him out. Ain't never seen you before, though. He said nonchalantly as he unlocked the large closet at the back of the room. The double doors opened up to reveal an assortment of especially nasty-looking bladed weapons. Some long and curved, some short and serrated, but all of them looked sharp enough to slice through a Thanksgiving turkey with little to no resistance. Were I were to wager a guess, my body would be taking the place of the traditional birdie in this case. Ain't as easy to snatch folks up this time of year. The stranger, who was now slipping out of his padded coat, said, I, I may have to move to a more populated town soon, you know? He continued, unzipping the hoodie. 
I try to keep moving. Ain't too smart to linger anywhere for too long with hobbies like mine. He lay the hoodie over the desk that sat against the rear wall while reaching for the apron that hung on the inside of the cabinet door. Couldn't resist trying to get one more before the end of the year. He tied the apron lace around his waist before studying the contents of his well-armed closet. <sighs> you know, it being Christmas and all, I'll show you a bit of compassion. What do you say? He asked, turning to face me for the first time since our, well, introduction. You want it quick and easy, or want me to take my time a bit? He was speaking as casually as if he was asking what side I wanted with my burger. Can I, uh, think about it for a while? I asked, shrugging as much as I could while strapped to a cold-ass table. That's a big no, partner, but I can't blame you for trying. He replied, bursting out laughing at the end. Worth a shot. I sighed. So... He continued, drying his eyes with the back of his hand, still chuckling slightly. What's it gonna be? I adjusted my head as much as I could to look the man in the face. His dark eyes had a certain hunger behind them. I thought I may attempt to stall him a little, at least give myself some extra time to come up with some semblance of a plan to get out of this. I can't say I'm pressed for time or anything. I replied, I'm sure my wife is getting worried by now, but I assume you're not planning on letting me head home anytime soon. Of course, I imagine it's safe to say that taking your time a bit, as you said, I waved my fingers in air quotes, which were far less effective while strapped down, would be a good deal more painful for me, though I would think far more satisfying for you. On the flip side, I continued, what you call quick and easy is sure to kick my bucket far sooner than I'd like, so you gonna drone on all night, he whined, interrupting my train of thought. Well, it's a relatively big decision, I reasoned. Christ, just give me an answer or I'm gonna choose for you, he belted out. He was glaring at me with his hands on his hips and head tilted to the side. It felt similar to the time. I accidentally chucked the baseball through the windshield of my dad's car. That, I'm not angry, just disappointed sort of look. The idea of someone I presume to be a serial killer being let down by my actions almost made me feel like giggling a bit. Well? He yelped. Ugh. I don't know, I retorted. What would you choose? Huh, he said, instantly calming from his previously aggravated state, while forming an expression that almost resembled a poor attempt at a Robert De Niro impersonation. I guess I never really thought about it from the other side of the table, he said. He grabbed the armrest of the chair, which rested in front of the desk and glided it across the floor to my bedside. He rubbed the back of his neck while taking a seat next to where I lay. I mean, I get what you're saying now. He said, it really is a tricky situation. Right? I replied, feebly shrugging again. Sure, quick wouldn't hurt nearly as bad. Wouldn't really do a whole lot for me either, to tell you the truth. He continued, showing almost exaggerated effort on his face. Slow would definitely not be a walk in the park for you, but I'd sure as shit have a good time. He was rubbing his hand across the stubble on his chin. That way is a hell of a lot more tiring too, and it's been a long friggin' day. He said. We glared at each other, each of us puzzling over both sides of the equation. It's a conundrum. He said, shaking his head with a half smile. A uh, dilemma, even, I remarked. The room fell silent as we considered our options, though I wouldn't say I was in a particular rush to come up with whatever would qualify as a mutually beneficial selection. I would imagine we each had a differently desired outcome in mind. As I lay there considering my next move, I became aware of the lump in my back pocket. 
The stranger had apparently not thought to remove my wallet as he stripped down my upper half in preparation for the night's activities. And it would appear he'd also neglected my trusty pocket knife, which felt like it still lay snugly in the other pocket. Flip a coin? I suggested, breaking the silence in hopes of distracting the pondering man for a moment. Now that's a great idea, he exclaimed, holding his pointer finger up as though he were chanting Eureka. He quickly got to his feet and practically sprinted the small distance between the chair and his jacket. He rummaged around in the pockets while I gently slid my left butt cheek in the direction of my leather-bound wrist. All right, I'm going to say heads we make it a quickie and tails we go all night. What you think? He asked, spinning in place to look me in the eye. I was attempting to be as discreet as possible, but I was almost caught red-handed when he turned. Luckily, he appeared too distracted to notice what I was attempting to do. Sounds fair, I said, tilting my head. He grinned like a madman and went back to digging through his coat and hoodie. Before I felt secure enough to get back to my quest, the man dropped his hands to his side dejectedly and turned to face me again. No coins, damn it, he said, shaking his head side to side. Well, shit, I agreed. He glanced around the room as though there was a secret stash of quarters he'd neglected. Be right back, he stated before heading towards the door he'd previously entered through. Don't go anywhere, I heard him chuckle as he darted up an apparent stairway. With the door ajar, I could make out the sounds of the odd individual rummaging through drawers, seemingly right at the top of the flight of stairs. I wasted no time in continuing my efforts to free my knife from my pants. I finally gripped onto it with my fingertips while I heard items heavy and light scattering across the floor above. I pulled my weapon of choice free and flipped the blade open. I slipped it between the strap and my wrist and quickly began carving through the belt. Just as a jubilant yell echoed from above, followed by excited footsteps thundering down the steps, I managed to break my left hand loose. I gripped my knife underhanded and prepared to strike as soon as he got close enough. When something happened, I don't think either of us saw coming. Given the fact the cold steel table I was propped upon was facing away from the entrance to the room, I can only speculate what occurred based on the noises I heard. The hammering footfalls seemed to come to a halt as soon as the man hit the threshold to the room I occupied. There was a loud snapping sound, followed by the beginning of an F-bomb leaving the man's lips, accompanied by a screaming oof. I then found myself able to view the shaggy dark hair of the man as he slid face first across the floor to my right, while a shiny nickel rolled towards the cupboard full of nasty carving tools. The complete absence of anything audible afterwards left me to conclude that he'd knocked himself out cold. I took the opportunity to unbuckle the belts around my other wrist and ankles before heaving the man from the ground to the table I'd previously occupied. Unfortunately, my cutting through the left strap rendered me unable to buckle all of his limbs, so I simply sliced through a few tendons in his forearm while he slept. I managed to locate my shirt and jacket, which had been tossed on the plastic-lined floor in the corner of the room. Once I felt the warm blood make its way through my extremities again, I dug through the stranger's jacket in hopes of finding a phone to call my wife. I could only assume my own device was still on the side of the road I was abducted from, but I'd committed Christine's number to memory since our first official date. Not only was my search successful in locating a phone, but I also recovered a set of keys. I had absolutely no clue where I was at the moment, but I should be free to use whatever vehicle these operated when I was done here. With his device in hand, I was finally able to check on what time it was. Seeing that it was a little after four in the morning, I had little doubt that my love would be bordering on frantic at my delayed return home. 
Even though I was calling from an unfamiliar number, she answered within two rings, and, as predicted, she was bordering on tears when she heard my voice. I informed her what had happened and assured her I'd be home as soon as I was able. Even though I had little choice in the matter, I still apologized for not being able to track down what she had a hankering for. Still, I promised I'd bring her home the heart of the dark-haired man who now lay strapped to the cold metal table. She had been craving nothing but brunette women for a while now, but she still sounded delighted when I promised to bring her the tasty snack momentarily. It wasn't always easy being married to a werewolf, but my own unique talents paired with hers quite nicely. Even more so, since her pregnancy rendered her unable to hunt for the last few months. I must say, the wealth of tools I now had access to would make things much easier for me. Though I was very skilled with my trusty pocket knife, it's always a bitch to get through the sternum, especially on these cold nights when I can barely feel my fingertips. I'll be home soon, baby. I said to Christine, making kissing noises into the phone, while the man bound to the table was moaning himself back to awareness. He spilled a mess of profanities and grunts when he realized that we'd switched positions. I pulled his apron over my head and tied the cord around my waist while he writhed and shouted. So, I said, interrupting his alarmed curses when he realized he could not control his left arm. Would you like it quick and easy, or should I take my time? I asked. His reply was not very helpful. Fortunately, while the stranger raged on, I noticed the light reflecting off the shiny nickel that lay at the base of the tool closet. Heads! I exclaimed, retrieving the coin from the floor. Looks like quick and easy for the win. I continued before reaching for his phone once more. I made a quick search for a festive playlist to provide a joyful soundtrack for the work ahead. I smiled as I shuffled through the vast menu of Christmas tunes with the knowledge I would be back in my wife's loving arms soon. Soon.